Good morning, everybody. Good morning, all of you who've joined us online as well. Great to have you in the house of the Lord and worshiping God with us this morning. We pray that you'll have a, a great experience with the Lord and that he'll be drawing you close to himself uh, this morning. Just a few announcements as we begin our time of worship together. A reminder that next Sunday is our soup Sunday. Uh, so far, we have three people making soup. Unless we're going to hope for a miracle of bread and fish, we're going to need more soups. So please sign up for some soups, and please make sure that you sign up as well to help out. Uh, we, uh, we love that ministry of fellowship and food, so please sign up today. Also, um, uh, to let you know that there is a, a baby shower being held for Nicole, Stephen and Anita, Anita's uh, daughter, Nicole, and that's happening on May 25th. The details are in the bulletin, including the registry, so please have a look there. Also, uh, we got a, a, a desire for an announcement in terms of the March for Life that is happening in Toronto. That's happening on May 11th. Um, it's to happen around the Queen's Park area, and then there's an opportunity to attend some seminars afterwards, some workshops afterwards, but you have to sign up for those in advance. So please see the details in the bulletin about that. Uh, it is a March for Life, for, um, for the life of uh, little ones, for the life of babies that are so valuable in our eyes and in the eyes of God. And also, just if you happen to notice uh, somebody by the name of Terry, with the last name T, uh, who's having a birthday today. Now, I'm not telling you what birthday it is. Apparently, once you get past a certain, it doesn't matter anymore, somebody said. I don't know if he's at that point or not, but if you see Terry today, he's over here. Uh, please uh, wish him a happy birthday today. Let's just bow in a time of prayer as we gather before our holy God. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you, Lord, that you are Lord, that you have created this safe place for us to worship, for us to meet and to sing songs of praise, God. We thank you for providing the facilities. We thank you for providing this body of believers, your family, Lord, that we can gather together to be encouraged, to be uplifted, and Lord, that we can be challenged by your word. Heavenly Father, we pray your hand will be upon everything that takes place this morning with worship teams and prayer ministry, the offering, everything, Lord. As we open your word, God, may you be heard. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. If you'd please stand with us. Um, we're going to stay standing throughout all the songs this morning, but if you feel like you, you need to sit down or you'd like to sit down, then please do whatever feels more comfortable for everybody. Okay. Lord of all creation. water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares
Be seated. At this time, we would invite the ushers to come forward and receive this morning's offerings.
blessed us beyond anything we can imagine. In all the heavenly blessings, we are partakers as believers. And you have given us in abundance all that we need for our physical needs and more. And as we look to this offering now, we ask that you'd use it for your glory, that it might bring the bread of life to the hungry, that it might bring light to those in darkness, that you might enable the men of God to serve you, and that your kingdom would grow, and that we would call you Lord and Savior, and God above all creation. Father, take these offerings and use them in your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Just go to a time of prayer now. <clears throat> Corporate prayer is a privilege that we we all have as believers and as people of a local church. Let's just bow our heads now and, and pray. There's a few new prayer items that you will, I'm sure, hear about, but let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you first of all, for the freedom we have to gather. We are a privileged people that can come, open doors with your word on a sign on our lawn, come with our Bibles and sing loudly to a Savior and Lord. Father, we thank you that you have placed us and given us this privilege. May we never take it for granted. We pray for our brothers and sisters who do not have such freedom, that you would protect them, that they might know your presence, and you would strengthen them. Father, we do pray for the churches around us, as we do for our church, that we would preach the gospel, the clear gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of our Lord and Savior. May we continue to preach a gospel that's not watered down, that's not tickle the ears of our people but would be from your word would be clearly proclaimed we just thank you for the freedom we have so many churches in our area may you guide the leaders of those churches to continue to lift up Christ to expound on his magnificent work and all that he is to us we do pray also for the service that's going on right now at Centennial be with John and the team as they bring the good news, as they sing the great hymns of faith, and that those there would be encouraged, those shut-ins might be blessed, might be reminded of your promises, might give thanks for a God and a Savior. Father, forgive us when we fall short as we continue as our, our walk Give us strength. Give us a, a desire to follow you, to be obedient, to love your word, to love the church, and just to have a, a heart for those that are lost. Help us to, to worship rightly and seek eternal things above the temporal. Give us courage to share what you have shared with us in opening our eyes to the truth of the gospel. Help us to love those. Father, be with the hurting now. Many are spiritually downtrodden, looking for answers, wondering why. May you give them hope. May you give them truth and light. May they see through the challenges of this world and seek things above. Father, we're so thankful for the way that you've healed our people. We, we thank you that Andrea, even this morning, is watching online. We pray for her, for her recovery. We thank you how, how that Andrea's situation has brought our church together in prayer. May we continue 
to do so. Pray for, for John, who the Zabbats have been witnessing to. He's recovering from surgery. Just be with him. Father, there's many others who are awaiting testing, are going through difficult times and wondering. Father, just be with them. May they know your peace. Many have had tragedy in their life. Comfort them. Help them to trust. Help them to lay their burdens on you. Pray for the elderly. Give them minds that can comprehend your promises. It would be able to read your word and understand it and take strength and hope from it. Father, we just thank you that we have your word with us. And we pray for the Sunday school this morning. Pray for the leaders and that they have the words of life with them and they can share it, albeit by a simple way, but the gospel is simple. And may the words of truth touch the hearts of those. May there be obedience with the children that the leaders may be able to accomplish what they desire. May you continue to give us this privilege to have young ones come and hear the word of God to sing praises, to gather together. May there be unity and peace between them as they gather. Father, we pray for Dave as he's going to bring the message this morning. Be with him. May your spirit speak through him. May we as a, a listening people hear the words that you have for us, that our hearts might be open to the message. May we be challenged, encouraged. May we be lifted up in all things. Father, we're thankful that we can come this first day of the week to build ourselves up, to, to be ready for the week to come. Help us for the rest of this day and the days through the week to be a people who are thankful to know that we are sheep in your pasture and you care for us. Father, help us to be loving one another, be loving to the world around us and show Jesus in our lives. Help us to have a Christ-like walk. We just thank you for equipping us in the way that you do. Thank you for our church family. We ask that you continue to be with us as our service moves to the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Howie. Uh, I invite you all, please, to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. Um, it's been a little while uh, with Easter and all that. We've been, I've been kind of plowing through a bit of a service, and I know some of the different elders and I have been kind of trying to preach on a series about the church. And so uh, this morning we're going to be looking at the church um, responsibility for evangelism. I called it the blahs of evangelism. Now, I should have probably not called it that, uh, but there's, there's an acronym there that I'm following, the BLAs of evangelism. But let's uh, turn to, Ma uh, sorry, to uh, John chapter 5, and I'll be reading verses 1 to 15 as we uh, see this situation that Jesus encounters with a man who's paralyzed. John chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Sometime later, and when it says later, Jesus had just preached, by the way, uh, met with a Samaritan woman around the well. She went back to her people, and there's a huge turning to the gospel, turning to Jesus Christ of the Samaritan people. And all that has taken place right before this. And so sometimes later, it says in verse 1, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool where the water, when the water is stirred. And while I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, 
Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the men who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick up, pick it up and walk? And Jesus, and the man, sorry, and the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse will happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. The Lord bless the reading of his word to our ears this morning. Let's bow in a word of thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this encounter that Jesus had some 2,000 years ago. One of his many encounters with people, Lord, in which we can learn such a great deal about ministry from. So, Lord, open our eyes and our hearts to your word this morning. Overcome my limitations, Lord, and may your word go out powerfully as we look on your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that in his name. Amen. When I was preparing for um, uh, this Wednesday's Bible study with the young people, I came across this survey of Canadian people and their views towards religion. And it's a fairly recent one. It's uh, only 2021, so it's only like three years ago. And in that survey of people's views of religion, about almost 55% of Canadians uh, assimilated or or said that they were affiliated with being Christian. 55% of people in Canada said they align themselves with Christian values, Christian principles. And I was a little bit blown away by that stat. But I also remember a survey that I looked at it last time I preached, and, and it said that people who are Christians think that going to church regularly is once a month, right? So I'm not sure how 55% of Canadians associate themselves with being Christian. By the way, just for information, of almost 35% associate themselves with being atheist. That is way more than all the other religious groups combined in this country. And I struggle a little bit with the 55% for Canadians because I think people associate themselves with Christianity just kind of by default sometimes. Uh, you know, you see somebody wearing a cross on their neck and they're, you know, that makes, you know, there's something about the cross on their neck, but you know their lifestyle doesn't really live up to that cross. I think people just by default sometimes in Canada associate with being a Christian. But there's a need in this country There's a huge need when the second biggest religion that is being followed is atheism. There is a huge need in this country for people to understand what it truly means to be a Christian. Jesus entered into ministry, and I'm going to flip us to actually Luke chapter 5 just to begin this morning. Luke chapter 5. Go back a chapter to the left, and in Luke chapter 5, after Jesus has called Levi and said, Levi, come and follow me. And Levi follows him. It says, actually, he got up and left everything he had to follow Jesus. And then Levi does a remarkable thing. He has a party at his house. He throws a banquet at his house. And at the banquet, we see a large crowd of people who gather at Levi's house. And that banquet is for Jesus Christ. Because he's following Jesus now. And Jesus means something to him. And when we turn to Luke chapter 5, verse 31 to 32, at this banquet, what happens is the disciples are there, Jesus is there, and there's a whole lot of tax collectors and Pharisees who are very antagonistic towards faith in Jesus Christ. And they ask the question to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why do you eat with these dirty, filthy, immoral people? And Jesus answers the question in verse 31. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That is a statement of statements by Jesus Christ. It's a powerful statement about what Jesus is saying as his mission. I have not come for people who think they are righteous. 
I am coming for people who recognize their sickness and who need repentance from God. It drove everything that Jesus did in his ministry, everything. When he was teaching the disciples, he was equipping them to go and minister and preach the gospel to the sick, to call people to repentance and trust in Jesus Christ. When he was doing healings, it was to display his power and his miraculous uh, testimony that he is the sent one of God. But those miracles were personal for the people who received them. And the healing that came to them was because Jesus came for the sick. Jesus correcting the religious leaders throughout his teaching time. He was correcting this false image that there's a certain righteousness that we can accomplish on our own. Jesus was confronting that. He says, I'm not coming for that. I'm coming for those who recognize their sickness. The stats that I read out at the beginning of this message tell us that we are in a sick country. Uh, We don't have to live here too long, but we are in a sick country. There's a lot of people who associate with Christianity who don't really know what that means. There's a whole lot of people who associate with disbelief, and they're very firm in that. We are in a sick country that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The setting uh, of our scripture in John chapter 5 is this beautiful setting just north of Jerusalem, just north of the temple in Jerusalem, there was these two pools. And one of those pools is the pool in which this conversation happened uh, with Jesus and this paralytic man. And it's interesting, the pool of Bethesda, referred to in John chapter 5, is actually means the pool or the house of mercy. And isn't it beautiful that Jesus uses a pool associated with mercy when he brings healing to a man who's been sick for 38 years? Because Jesus was showing mercy on this man. It was a two-section pool, uh, front and back, and there was, it was covered by five roofed porches. And we're not sure, some of the older manuscripts talk about, you know, when an angel would stir the water with the finger, the people would go, we, those are old, uh, older and less reliable manuscripts, so they're not included in many of our versions today. But whether it's because of the shade that these porches offered, or whether it's the nearness to the temple, or whether it's some healing property in the water, this area was filled with people who were suffering from different disabilities. Jesus had come to that environment. He'd come to that setting as part of the required festival and is about to perform the third of his seven signs that are recorded in the Gospel of John. Make no mistake, there was a great number of people, it says in verse 3, that were gathered around this pool. A great number of sick people, paralyzed, lame people who could not move, people who had skin diseases, etc., etc. They were looking for relief. They were looking for healing. And in that midst of the great number of people, Jesus finds this one man, this one man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. Don't know how long he had been coming to the pool looking for relief, but the understanding is it had been for quite a while. And it is in that setting that Jesus lives out this beautiful life philosophy that I have come for the sick, not for those who are self-righteous. There's a beautiful pattern that is shown here in John chapter 5, and I want to just read through it this morning, go through it with us. Jesus' pattern for evangelism is, re- is revealed in this. And the first part of that pattern of evangelism is being there. In verse 6, being there. Jesus showed up at a busy time with lots of people, with a whole lot of people gathering around this pool. Jesus could have easily skirted around that sickness area and just gone to the temple or gone to be with the other people, but he didn't. He chose to go to the pool where people were sick. He was there. He chose to go to one of the many people to bring healing. He was present with them. And it's not just here. It's a pattern that Jesus has throughout the Gospels as you read it where Jesus spends his time. He spends a lot of time with his instruction and teaching of the disciples, no question. But Jesus spends a lot of time at gatherings, a lot of time at social get-togethers. In John chapter 2, 
He's at the wedding feast. Remember the first of his miracles where the host ran out of wine and Jesus turns the water into wine to save the embarrassment of the host at that gathering? But that was at a, at a wedding feast. In John chapter 4, a couple of chapters later, where he's meeting the Samaritan woman, it's around a well, a gathering place for people who are there to get water. In Matthew chapter 8, when he was meeting, he was out in the crowd in the community with a leprous man. And when he goes and sees this leprous man, he hugs him, something nobody would do in that day. Jesus did. He was out among the people. In the passage I read earlier in Luke chapter 5, he's hanging out at a banquet where there's a whole bunch of people that are invited who hate him. (laughs) Who would want to go to that party? Would you want to go to a party where the people that were invited hated you? No, we like the celebrations. We like like the, the happy ones. This was not a happy one, a happy environment for Jesus, yet he was there. He was around crowds when he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. Jesus intentionally placed himself in groups of people, in gatherings where he was meeting people on their turf. There's an interesting, I don't know how many of you have heard of William Booth, the great evangelist, uh, but William Booth is a fantastic evangelist, uh, and he had a heart for the Lord and to get the word out. And when his son Bramwell was 13 years old, grade 8, 13 years old, don't recommend you do, all do this, but William Booth, because he wanted his son to develop a passion for the lost and the sick, he took his 13-year-old son to the local saloon, the local bar. And he walked into that local bar with his 13-year-old son, and he said to his son, These are the people I want you to bring to Jesus Christ, which inspired faith and a passion for reaching the lost in young Bramwell. I want to ask you a question. How many of us here today, and I'm going to ask you to put your hands up, how many of us here today became believers because of the intentional ministry of a person bringing us the gospel of Jesus Christ? How many here? Hands up. How many here today Okay, I'm seeing 20, 30, maybe 40 of us today because if somebody was intentional placing themselves in your environment, in your life, in our environment, in in our lives to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next question is tougher. Do we place ourselves among those who need a doctor? Do we place ourselves regularly among those who are sick? Or are we just containing our lives as a, as a father with young children, we had the joy of uh, having aquariums and fish in our family, okay? Uh, it's, it's a joy because while they're living, it's wonderful. And when they're not living, it's not so great. The, 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 the toilet gets used quite a bit when they're not living. But we had this wonderful, wonderful environment where we created this safe habitat for these fish to grow and learn and one of the greatest experiences, though, in our aquarium kind of living or, was when we took the fish out of the aquarium and put them in the pond. We have a small pond in the backyard. We put them in the pond in the backyard, and we created the environment for them, the, pond, the pads and all that stuff, and they lived, and they, they did really well for a long time. And then one year, when we were back there and we were checking out everything and seeing these fish, and they'd grown pretty big, we noticed these small little black ones. These small little black fish appeared from nowhere. There was a ton of them. And we were sitting there going, where did they come from? This wasn't part of the environment we created. And, and next thing you know, we had these little black fish that we also had to take care of and tend to. Sometimes, instead of being what Peter was told to do, go be fishers of men, sometimes we're just trying to tend the aquarium. Just take care of of the environment that we are in. But that's not what Jesus asked. He said, go. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm not going to contain you in an aquarium or a pond. I want you to go out in the open sea and the open lakes. I want you to go and bring in people from all over the place into the gospel and present them the gospel of Jesus Christ. The late Sam Shoemaker, who was a, a, an evangelistic bishop, summed the situation this way. He said, in the Great Commission, the Lord has called us to be like Peter, fishers of men. But instead, we've turned that commission around so that we have become merely keepers of the aquarium. 
We're so protective of what we have created and kept that we're afraid to go out and risk being on other people's turf, on the turf of the sick and the needy. We need to be there. So when somebody is struggling in our lives, maybe it's a coworker, a neighbor, a family member, when somebody is struggling, we need to be there. When somebody is, somebody is struggling because they don't have the basics of life and the basic needs of life, we need to be there. Jesus was there for a paralytic because he was there for the sick. We need to be there. We've had in our bulletin over the last few weeks, or if not a month, a need for volunteers at the refuge and volunteers at Gate 316, and there's so many needs that are around there. We need to be where these people are so that we can bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we're not there, then we won't have anything to share. Being there, Jesus modeled being there in this passage, but he didn't just model being there. He, he, he didn't just place himself intentionally there, but he also took time to learn about this man and his need. If you look carefully at verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there, so being there, and learned that he had been in this condition for a long while. Well, hold on a second. We glance over that. How did Jesus learn that he had been there for a long time? I mean, I know Jesus is God and he knows all things. And so it's, you know, it, it's, it's kind of there. But, the, but in the writing of the gospel, God doesn't instruct John to write down because Jesus knew everything. He knew the man was sick. He says, and as he learned this man's condition, how do we learn? In fact, the word learn here uh, used in the Greek is gnosis, which means actually a seeking to know or an inquiring so what does that tell us? Jesus was either talking to the man himself and saying, hey, what's going on with, tell me your story. Or at least he was asking the people around this man, hey, what's his story? Regardless of how it unfolded, Jesus took the time to learn what this man's needs were, what his condition was. How often we skip this step in our efforts to evangelize. How often we skip this step when we go in and try to bring the gospel to somebody that we don't do a little bit of research and work to find out where they are at. And instead, we just plow ahead with, without doing our homework and we just present something to them, but we're blind to their needs. It's a very interesting passage. I, I wrestle with it a bit because Jesus heals the man and then he walks away. He had to... Beautiful ministry. I mean, this, a book would be written on the ministry opportunity of Jesus to stand there and explain everything he does to the man about who he is. But no, Jesus heals him and then walks away. Very interesting methodology that he's using. But Jesus took the time to get to know that man. And in verse 6, the second part of it, he says this question. Do you want to get well? I have been unable to move for 38 years, and somebody asked me the question, do you want to get well? I mean, seriously. But Jesus took the time to ask, do you want to get well? One of the greater uh, people that I've met in terms of evangelism um, always has this catchphrase for his life and his ministry, and that is, I don't want to know how much you know until I see how much you care. Don't tell me how much you know until I see how much you care. In this whole encounter with Jesus and this man, he takes the time to sit down either with this man or other people. He learns his story. And when he's talking with this man, he knows what the man's deepest need is. We all know what people's need is. The need is for Jesus Christ. But this man who's been lame for 38 years, what he wants is he wants to be able to walk again. So Jesus asks a question, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? An evangelist once uh, was speaking to a crowd and somebody said, well, it's kind of, evangelism is kind of like, you know, we have to learn how to take the horse to water. You know, we have to learn how to lead people to the water of Jesus Christ. And the evangelist turned around and said, actually, that's not what we need to do. What we need to do is actually, it's not important 
that we make them drink, but we have to create in them a thirst for the water. A thirst for the water. And that's what Jesus did by taking time to get to know this man in his need. He showed him that he cared and that he cared enough to ask the man, what does he really want out of life? And this man said, "Ah, I want to be well. I want to be well. People's needs vary. And we cannot afford to assume things about them. Uh, There's a room and place for all sorts of different types of evangelism. We can go door to door and bring tracts and just say, how can I pray for you? But if we want to be really effective in a lot of our efforts to evangelize, we need to get to know the people we are going to. Because then we can ask the question, do you want to be well? Do you want relief from your struggle? Do you, do you want to find meaning and purpose in life because you feel like you're not? Do you want to be well? And Jesus intentionally took the time and effort to know his needs. If we're going to be effective in a lot of our evangelistic work, we need to recognize what are the people's needs. So I ask you to do that. I ask you to think about the people that you're trying to witness to or minister to. People who you're trying to bring the gospel to. What is their need? And how can I tie the gospel in to that need? Eventually, with the opportunity to be able to share Jesus Christ is truly what you need. Jesus intentionally took the time and effort to know people's needs. And then finally, and and powerfully and beautifully, Jesus acted upon the need. We see in verse uh, 8 that Jesus acted upon the need, for sure. Uh, Jesus said, get up, up, pick up your mat, and walk. He healed the man. And, and he walked away from the man. He slipped out into the crowd, it says. And the man walks away being healed, but he doesn't know anything about Jesus at that point. It says it in verse 13. When the people asked him, who told you to pick up your mat and walk? He said, I don't know. I have no idea who it was. Because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. The man had no idea that it was Jesus Christ who had healed him. No idea. But then Jesus does a powerful thing in verse 14. He found him at the temple and said to him, hold on, he found him at the temple. Which means that after Jesus did the healing of this man and he walked away and slipped into the crowd, he allowed that man to have an opportunity to walk on legs that hadn't been walked on in 38 years to go around and tell people, I've been healed. I've been that guy over at the pool for 38 years or however long. I've been a guy who hasn't been able to move for 38 years. And he gives them the opportunity to go and tell everybody about this miracle that has happened to his life. And then Jesus finds him. He goes after him. Jesus goes back to the area or around the temple area where the man, he found him. He was purposely looking for this man that he could talk to him. Again, he pursued intentionally a follow-up with the man to proclaim the gospel. And it wasn't easy. The temple area was flooded with people. There's people everywhere. And he went and he found this man. And even though the man didn't know who he was, Jesus related to the man's real need. That he was able to say to that man, you are sick and you're not just in need of healing physically, but you now recognize your need is to deal with the sinfulness in your life. Jesus wasn't just talking about it, he was doing it. He was following up after that man He had the encounter. How many times have we had an experience or an opportunity to talk with somebody about something about God? Just in a conversation, it comes up and it comes up and... And, and we have an opportunity to share for a few minutes about our faith. And then we walk away or the conversation ends and, and we never go back to it. Jesus went back to it. He went back to it. There's a great story of D.L. Moody, one of the great preachers, evangelists. And he was attending a conference. And the conference was on evangelism. And there was uh, seminars all set up and great People were going to preach and talk about evangelism and all that. And D.L. Moody goes to this conference, and uh, he brings with him a friend of his who's a song leader. And an hour before the conference is supposed to start, D.L. Moody says to the song leader, come on, let's go. And they go out onto a corner of the street about a block away from the conference. And Moody says to, 
to the worship leader, stand up on that soapbox and start singing. And so in the middle of nowhere, doing whatever is going on with people around, this worship leader starts singing songs of praise to God. And before long, there's a huge gathering of people around this man singing. Beautiful voice, singing songs of praise. People gather. He's got their attention. And so Moody gets up on the same soapbox, and he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, What I want you all to do now is go to this conference that is happening a block from here. So all these people go into this conference hall and they fill the hall. These people who have just heard the gospel, some of them for the first time, go to this conference center on what it it means to evangelize, how to evangelize, and they show up and they fill the place. They fill the place. Because D.L. Moody just didn't believe about talking about evangelism, but actually going out and doing it. We need to be doers in our world. We need to be doers in the world. We need to go and find sick people. We need to go and find out the needs of people that are around us. We need to go and reach out and support and encourage one another with the opportunity, that open door, to be able to say, your real need, the real solution is Jesus, and let me tell you about him. But we need to be doers, not just talkers. In West Africa, there's an area called the Sahel, Sahel, the Sahel, which is a 7,000 kilometer stretch right below the Sahara Desert. And in this part of West Africa, they only get rain on May, June, July, and August. Four months of the year, they get all the precipitation for the year, nothing else for the rest of the year. So in May, June, July, and August, they plant everything, and they, a couple of months later, they reap all this harvest, and they gather all the grain, and there's a credible bounty in the months of like October and September, but by the time they get to January, they have to reduce in their families one meal because they're running out of food. By the time February hits, they're down to one meal a day, and by the time April hits, they have one cup of oatmeal for each person in the family. And in the rooms of these people's homes, there is a bag, and there's a bag of grain that was harvested in the harvest that hangs from the wall. And people long to just open up that bag in that family and rip it open and grab the grain and just feed themselves because of the malnourishment that has set in and because of the, of the sickness that has set in. But the parents of those families do not allow anybody to touch that grain because that grain is the grain that needs to be planted for May, June, July, and August for next year's harvest. When African pastors are speaking and preaching at the time of year when it rolls around in April, the African pastors preach on Psalm 126, which says this, Brothers and sisters, this is God's law of the harvest. Don't expect to rejoice later unless you have been willing to sow in tears. Because families have to limit what their family can consume. And they do so with great pain and struggle so that they can survive another year. My question this morning for us is, are we willing to sow in tears? Are we willing to count the cost that is necessary for evangelism? I know some of you are saying, I'm too young to be an evangelist. (laughs) No, you're not. You have a wonderful opportunity to invite people to church or Sunday school or to explain why you do what you do. You can bring people into church to play basketball or volleyball or to programs like VBS or sports club. You You can have an influence no matter how old you are for Jesus Christ. You're never too young to be an evangelist. Well, hold on, but I'm, I'm kind of too old to be an evangelist. No, you're not. Nobody is too old to be an evangelist. It might be a lot of hard work. You might have to, you know, try to get up and move around more and meet your neighbors or go to places where people are, and maybe that's a struggle. So if you can't do that, maybe you have to learn this incredible world of internet <laughs> and you can learn some of it. I know it's not easy, and a lot of people, as they get older, I can't understand that stuff. I don't know how to do anything on it. But if you're trying to reach sick people, 
you can use all these resources that we have been blessed with to be able to reach sick people. There's no excuse, no matter how old or young we are. But the question is, do we want to just maintain the fish tank? Do we want to just maintain the aquarium or the pond that we've been placed in? Or do we want to go into the open sea and reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, going on their turf, being there for them, learning about what it is like for them, like Jesus did, and then acting upon it, showing them how much we care for them. Will we go out to sea and be fishers of men? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for Jesus and just the profound ministry. Oh, God, how wonderful it would have been to just watch him do what he did. Just to watch him moving around Lord, to see the intentionality of everything that he did. God, how wonderful it would have been to eyewitness him. And yet, God, we have right before us today a story. We can see it. We can hear it. We can hear his words and see his interactions, Lord, of how he cared so deeply about people. I pray, God, that you will give us that passion for the sick. God, that you will give us that motto for our own lives that we are here for those who need you. God, stir up in us a desire to risk whatever it takes to go and evangelize and bring others into the kingdom of Jesus Christ through your reconciliation, through your redemption, God, through your forgiveness of sin. Help us, God. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all please join with us and stand and sing our last song?
faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you are here this morning and you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus or you, you recognize in your life you need more of him, please speak to one of our leaders before you leave today and they'll be able to share with you who he is and what he has done for you uh, that you might know his love and his grace. Now to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I encourage you to be watchful, stand firm in your faith, be courageous and be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Now it is time to go and enter our mission field. Let's go in the name of Jesus Christ.